أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الحبيب المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا وأما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفحسبتم أنما خلقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected scholars, my elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the all magnificent, the all gracious, for the countless blessings and bounties that he has bestowed upon us, and the innumerable blessings that he has showered upon us, the most valuable and the most precious of all being the belief in him in Tawheed. And we are eternally grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for endowing us with the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad salawatullahi alayhi majma'een. With the plea to him and the prayer that he may he help us and give us tawfiq in learning the teach and implementing the teachings of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad so that tomorrow when we are resurrected on the day of judgment we are counted amongst those individuals who are a source of pride for the Ahlul Bayt and not a source of shame and embarrassment on the Day of Judgment. One belief, one concept, one doctrine has been the reason and not the cause, the reason for more conflict amongst human beings than anything else you can think of. More wars have been fought more battles have been had, more blood has been shed because of one belief, and that is the belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, the propaganda mechanism of the atheists, or the machinery of propaganda of the atheists, spearheaded by some of the top scientists of this world, and financed by some of the top, or the most wealthiest bodies of this world, is hard at work to try and, and convince the hearts and the minds of the innocent and the trusting human beings to the concept that there's no such thing as a wise and omnipotent creator that has created us and this universe around us. And that our existence and the existence of everything that we see around us is random, completely random, and came about as a mere chance. There is no logic, there is no plan behind our being. This is a notion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions. With a question in the Quran that means something different to you and I, to each individual on the face of this earth. And this is the beauty of the Holy Quran, that each verse talks to each individual on the face of this earth, on to them individually. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 10 in Surah Ibrahim says, أَفِي اللَّهِ شَكٌ فَاطِلُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ and in the verse which we recited at the beginning of our lecture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 115, chapter 74, Surah Al-Mu'minun, says, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Did you really think that we have created you? And if we were to extrapolate the meaning, did you really think that we have created you and this vast and massive universe around you in vain? And that you shall not return back to us? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges this mentality from the outset. That no, look around, there is a purpose behind this. And so first and foremost we must recognize that the phenomena that we face today has always existed in the human race. From the time of Adam alayhi salam till today, we find that when man is cornered or feels threatened about his stature in, in the society, or his wealth, or his power, he picks a fight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the Quran is filled with such examples. The example of Namrud, the example of Fir'aun, the example of Qarun and his wealth, the example of the pagans of Mecca. And so, when we come across various theories that are thrown at us in trying to explain to us the origin of our creation and the origin of the existence of time and space, we must realize a number of things. A, they are still called theory. And indeed, there are hundreds of th scientists today that challenge the theory of evolution and the, the Big Bang theory. But unfortunately, they, don't, they do not get the exposure because, because the media and the propaganda me mechanism is in the hands of those who are of the other camp. Secondly, these theories need to be examined and explored with, a, an, with an analytical view. Stripping away all the jargon, we need to understand in layman's term what are these theories trying to tell us. And while this is not our topic, we will inshallah touch on that a little bit. When we come to Islam, and we ask Islam, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we, find, we try and identify, oh Allah, what is the view of Islam with regards to establishing the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We find that Allah in the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt in their teachings find that this concept of trying to establish the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they see this as a fallacy. And in verse 10, Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorically says, Afillahi shakkun, fatirus samawati wal ard. Do you doubt in the existence of Allah, the creator of these magnificent skies and the earth? When we come to the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt, we find, for example, in Dua Arafah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the Dua which we all recited only 20 days ago on the day of Arafah. Of Imam alayhi salam says, Amiyat aynun la taraka alayha raqiba. Oh Allah, blinded is the eye that cannot see you. Watchful over it. Mataghibta li tahtaja ila dalil and yadullu alayk. Oh Allah, when were you ever absent? So that man today has the audacity of trying to find reasons to establish your existence. When were you ever absent? A man comes to our fifth holy Imam, Imam al Baqir, sallallahu wa sallam, wa alayhi. And he says, Imam, Yabna Rasulillah, and of course I'm saying Imam Yabna Rasulillah. He says, Yabna Rasulillah, tell me, how long has this God that you believe in has existed for? How long has he been in existence? Imam looks at him and smiles. And he says, a being that is confined in the round of time and space cannot be God. Imam continues, but I want to stop here and ask why. Why a being that is confined by time and space can never be God? And the answer is, because the, the follow-up question to this question, the, uh, the very logical question to, the next, to this, has to be, well, if he, if he existed before such and such, and such time, and at such and such place, well, who created who? Was, uh, did time exist before Allah, and did space exist before Allah? Therefore, you enter into a battle of who created who. And is there another creator? So Imam immediately replies that a being who can be confined to time and space, which are creation in their own rights, can never be God. Imam then continues, and he says, suffice it for you to know that he was and everything else became. He was, and everything else became. Here I remember one merit of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, and while it is not directly related to our topic, it is nonetheless related because he is the custodian of all the knowledge of the, of the prophets. A man came to the sixth holy imam, and in a very similar manner, that's why I'm saying it in brackets in 60 seconds, inshallah. A man came to our sixth holy imam, and he said, imam, the Muslim, Muslims are quarreling between them. Some say Ali ibn Abi Talib became a believer at the age of 10. Some say no, at the age of 10, no, nobody's belief is worth anything. When he became Balib, Imam, tell me, Mata Aman? The man asks, when did Ali ibn Abi Talib bring belief? Imam replies in two words. Look at the precision in Imam's reply. The man asked in two words, Mata Aman? Imam replies back, Mata Kafar? You tell me when was Ali ibn Abi Talib a non-believer for you to even ask when he became a believer. Similarly, Imam al-Baqir says, suffice it for you to know 
that he was and you became and everything else became. So, when we move further, we ask, oh, it's oh Allah. If, the, we, if we do not, if establishing your existence is not the aim, then why is it when I open the books to try and learn about Islam? When my kids go to madrasa, time and time again, they came, come across the notion, you must recognize Allah. You must find Allah. Man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. And these various traditions that say who, he who recognizes himself recognizes his Lord. Why is it that you are trying to ask me to find you? Are we not try, trying to find the same thing? Me and the atheist friend, are we not trying to find the same thing? He is saying, I want proof that Allah exists. We are, you are telling me, go find Allah. Are we not singing from the same hymn sheet? The answer is no. You see, the atheists today are actively trying to, dis to establish the non-existence of a deity, of a lord, of a creator. And they revolt back to a, a method of learning. You see, there are two ways we all learn. The first method that we all learn and gain knowledge is through a method known as al-ilm al-husuli, the acquired knowledge, or as we know it in today's term, the experimental way of learning. For example, and this is why we have come to respect science and scientists so much that it becomes inconceivable for us to even think that my fellow scientists would lie or try and put an act on me. But there, are some, there, are some, there is some background that we need to understand why they are so much trying to push atheism in today's world. So one method of learning is the method that modern science adopts. And that is through a series of experiments trying to establish, come to a realization or a fact. For example, let me give you an example. We have established, and the, this method it looks at the effect and tries to identify the cause to try and solve the problem at the cause. It's a little bit complex, but just stay with me. For example, we identify that human beings are dying of cancer, or are dying of malaria, or are dying of another particular disease. We therefore came across the effect. Something has happened, and the effect of that is human beings are dying. So we went to the laboratories, and we started running a series of experiments, trying to identify the cause of this malaria, the cause of this cancer. And through trial and error, trying to fix, apply certain fixes at the point of the cause, we have, tried, we have uh, accomplished eradicating some problems. And this is the method with which science has progressed so much. And this is why we have come to respect science so much that, we are, that it is in inconceivable for us that if, the, if, a, if a fellow scientist says there is no such thing as God, that it could, it's inconceivable to, for me to even question the validity of that statement. But there is an, and the flaw in this method is that the scientists today jazz up their statements, but in essence they are trying to say exactly the same thing which the pagans and the atheists of centuries ago were saying to the human beings around them. That a god that cannot be sensed and touched and felt and smelt and imagined cannot exist. In essence, that's what science is telling us. They want to bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the science lab. And they want to run a series of experiments and then they want to have an aha moment. Yes, that is God. That must be God. Islam refutes this nonsense. And when you ask the scientists, so you have advanced so much, Mr. Scientist, tell me, how much is the value of what you know in comparison to what you don't know? A couple of years ago, I was watching a documentary on the History Channel, or Discovery Channel, and I don't remember exactly, but I believe it was Stephen Hawkins that was asked. So the knowledge that we have now acquired about the universe in comparison to what we don't know, how does it compare? He said, what we know today about everything that we have learned in comparison to what we don't know is not even, is not even worth spitting on. These are my words. It's not even valuable. In other words, he is saying that today everything that we know is not even a drop in the ocean of the unknown. And so this level of knowledge, science wants us to bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of everything that exists into the world of this unknown. They know little of, the, of, of more, and they want to bring him into the lab to experiment on him. Islam says no. 
There is no way that you can run a series of experiments and find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we learn? Here the Ahl al-Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there is another method of learning, which is the method known as al-ilm al-hudhuri, knowledge that is instinctive. For example, when we look at the animal world and the insect world, we find that when an ant is born, or when a honeybee is born, it, after a few moments, it goes straight to work. The males know exactly what is their duty, and the females know what their duty is. But we never find them going to primary and secondary and college and university and PhD. How do they know what to do? And they do it with such perfection and such precision that today the world is baffled. How is this happening? Allah answers to this. In the Quran, He says, وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ Allah has given them that instinctive knowledge. And he has given you and I this knowledge as well. You know, when a baby is born, something that is essential to your life and my life is this inhaling and exhaling that we take so for granted. And inshallah, if we get a chance, we will talk a little bit about this blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet when a baby is born, we find that it inhales and exhales. And neither his mother has taught him to do that, nor has father taught him to do that. Automatically, he comes into this world and he knows, I must breathe in oxygen. I must extract carbon dioxide, otherwise I will die. Who taught him this? Who gave him this knowledge? And when you dig even deeper, who told my blood vessels to carry the oxygen and to repel away the carbon dioxide and other, and other harmful uh, gases? Who taught us this? Imam said that this is the knowledge. This is the door of knowledge from which you can recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why, O oh, Imam? Imam al baqir tells us. He says, because each and every one of us has already established and convinced himself that Allah exists. Where, O oh, Imam? He says, in the elementary world of our creation. When Allah lined us all up, and he says, Alastu bi rabbikum, do you not testify that I am your only Lord? We all answered, yes. You, me, the atheist, Darwin, everybody said, yes. When we came to this world, Rasulullah tells us we are born with that conviction that Allah is our Lord and He is our Creator. What happens then is that various veils are thrown upon us by our fa immediate family and by society, with which we begin to forget our Creator. And so in Islam, the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the journey of establishing His existence, but rather the journey of unveiling and uh, of uncovering the truth that already lies within us. Because while you and I already believe that Allah exists, but your actions and my actions do not testify to that. If I already believe that Allah exists, why do my actions not reflect the fact that He exists? And He is all seeing, and He is all merciful, and He is all knowing. Why do my actions not reflect that? And that is the journey towards perfection, towards knowing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and who He is. We came, we come, a man comes to Imam al Imam al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. He says, Imam, how. Or, oh, oh, Imam, what is the evidence that there exists a creator for this entire universe that we see around us? Imam said, you. He said, me? Imam said, yes, you are the proof. Because you did not exist. And you came into existence. And you know that you did not bring yourself into existence. Nor has anyone like you brought you into existence then this surely means that there is a hand working in the background who has brought you and everything that you see around you in existence. When we ask Darwin, Charles, tell me, what is the origin of our existence? After stripping away all the jargon, we come to the conclusion that Charles Darwin, Darwin tells us that we exist, we came into existence at the, at the back of a primeval, primeval soup, an organic soup that existed 3.5 to 4, 4.5 billion years ago, within which some living organism existed. 
and then they divided and split and they became into microorganisms who then decided, some of them decided we want to become plants, the others decided we want to become fish. Now of course there's a lot of complexities within this, I'm telling you in layman's term. This in essence we came about as a result of some living beings that existed in a primeval soup at the 4.5 billion years ago. Now Charles tell me, where did those living beings come from? You have told me in your theory, which is a theory, that we have all, every living being that exists on the face of this planet, and there is a hundred million plus, by the way, have come from those living things that existed in this primeval soup. But where did they come from? Where did they come from? Here, Darwin does not have an answer, and he doubts in his theory because of this. But the new Darwinists come in today, and they fill this gap with a new addition to this theory. Now remember, science, the reason we respect science today, because sometimes scientists look at us and they say, we want to base things on facts. And they mock us and they laugh at us and call us superstitious because we believe in a wise and omnipotent creator. So Mr. Scientist, who does not believe in superstition, look at their answer. Where did these living beings in that soup come from? They say that these were living organisms that managed to escape a planet far away. So they managed to escape the, the atmosphere of their planet far away. They traveled and landed on some comets, and those comets have brought them to us. Fantastic. So all the hundred billion plus living beings on the face of this earth are from outer space. We are all aliens. Fine. The same scientists teach your kids and my kids in the physics lessons that no living organism can ever survive the sheer pressure and the, and the vacuum that exists in space. The freezing cold, and freezing is an understatement, no living being can survive that freezing cold in the vacuum of space. Furthermore, no living being can, to can tolerate the x-rays and the solar radiation and other various toxic radiation that exists in that vacuum of space. Yet these living beings somehow manage to escape their planet. These are very minute microorganisms that cannot ever, can never be seen by the eye, by the way. They manage to escape. These are scientists who do not believe in superstition. They escaped their planet. They landed on a comet. The comets traveled across the vast areas of space, the dangerous space with x-rays and, 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 and radiation and freezing cold, and they managed to come alive in, onto Earth. And all the origin of life, as per his theory, started from there. Question number two. How does this non-intelligent, non these microorganisms, do not have the intelligence? How... Can a being which lacks the basic, the most basic of intelligence come up with such intelligent views that some of them decide to become plants, some of them decide to become fish, and then there is a hundreds, hundreds or billions of intelligent decisions that this non-intelligent being was able to make for you and I to see this perfectly functioning world around us. What a question. Non-intelligent microorganisms is able to make a decision that now I'm a fish, but I need to have some feet so I can walk outside the water. So now there should be some fish with some feet with them. But the fossil records say otherwise, that no such thing that exists. I'm a man, and I think I should have some eyes. And I think I should, I should try the eyes because it's a trial and error method of, of, of evolution. The eyes should exist in the chest. But there exists no beings in the fossil records that show eyes being developed in the, in the back and on my arms and on the head to eventually find its way to my skull. And to be functioning with this perfection that no intelligent human being till today is able to create a device like a television or camera that is able to project this perfect image that your eye and my eye is able to project. But this was an accident, and your TV is the planning of an intelligent human being. How is this possible? You see, Imam tells us, and the, imam, and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt tell us, 
You do not need to go to university and college and acquire PhDs to try and establish the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the theory of um, the, the theory, uh, the Big Bang theory, for example. Again, once you strip away all the jargon and all the complex terminologies, you come to the essence that this universe, according to this theory, came into existence because of the collision of certain elements. Yes? Those elements existed in a cocoon of a cell or something along those lines. The question is that we have to ask these scientists, where did those elements come from? Who put them there? It's okay telling me the earth came about as, as a result of this. And it's brilliant to learn this knowledge. But then to hypothesize that everything was a mere chance and a mere and randomness and there exists no wise and omnipotent creator is a completely different ballgame. Who put this, those elements there? Who moved them? Who collided them? Who initiated that movement? Who? And this is what Socrates came to realize. Socrates, who was prosecuted and, and killed for his belief in, Allah, in, in, a, in a God. He comes to a realization that this chair is from the wood. And the wood is from the tree. And the tree is from the seed. And the seed is from the fruit. And eventually all these effects lead to a cause that required no cause. An initiator who did not require initiating. A mover who did not require moving. And that is whom we call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This perfection that we see in existence in the solar system, in the universe around us, within our own selves, each and every body part of ours, from the liver to the heart to the eyes, is functioning with perfection. There has to be a wise and omnipotent creator behind this. And for that, we do not need to learn complex pieces of knowledge and then try to understand and establish his existence. One of the students of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. His name was Nu'man ibn Thabit, who learned under Imam for two years and then deviated and created his own sect of belief. He's famously known as Abu Hanifa, the Imam of the Hanafi school of thought. One day, as he was walking in the streets of his town and he was going towards the market in an entourage of his companions and his, dis and his disciples, when all of a sudden in the distance he sees a very learned atheist scholar, and his name was Samnan ibn Qais. As Samnan approaches closer, in the middle of the market, Nu'man decided that I want to show off a little bit and tell these people how they, uh, the wrong path that this man is following. And so as they crossed paths, he began shouting, Allah exists and all those who do not believe in Allah are polytheists and this, that and the other. Samnan understood. He was an intelligent person, atheist albeit, but very intelligent. He turns around to him and he says, Oh Nu'man, this Lord that you are so much shouting about, can you even prove to me that he exists? Nu'man said, of course I can, otherwise I wouldn't be preaching this religion and, and having all these students that want to follow me. So they, they agreed. Samnan said to him, okay, I'll tell you what. Let us enter into a debate for three days. One day I present my arguments, the second day you present your arguments, and the third day we conclude. If you are right and I am wrong, then I will come to this very spot in the middle of the market and I will profess that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and I have brought belief. But on the flip side, on the other hand, if you fail to convince me, then you must come and stand on the spot and profess and proclaim that there is no such thing as God that exists. So they entered the debate. Day one, Nu'man goes and he presents his arguments. He fails to convince the other side. Day two, Samnan presents his arguments. Nu'man fails to counteract the arguments. And so Nu'man knows he is completely and utterly defeated. And tomorrow, he will cause such a damage in Islam, because at that time Abu Hanifa was also the appointed scholar by the authorities of the time. So he was a government employee, and he was propagating the religion and the faith of the government, the Islamic government of the time. And so, completely defeated, he is walking back home sad, with a very stressed face. When all of a sudden he sees a friend of him, 
coming forward. The friend looks at his face and he says, Why are you so troubled, O Na'man? He explains to him the situation that tomorrow there will be such a big issue that Islam will be defeated. Allah's existence will be will, will Allah's existence will be annihilated because I have lost completely. The man said to him, Why, first and foremost, do you enter into arguments that are above your level? Secondly, he said to him, Do not worry. Go back to the door of knowledge, the custodians of knowledge, the man who taught you the little that you have. So some na so uh, so Nu'man decided, yes, I will go to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He enters to the house of Imam al-Sadiq. Salamu alaykum wa alaykum as salam. The first thing he says, oh Imam, I ask your pardon because I did not tell people to follow me, but in the, instead they, they decided to follow me. Imam said to him, leave you from these baseless arguments. Tell me what is happening between you and Samna. Imam says to Imam is foretelling him, I'm saying, what's happening between you and Samna? He says, Imam, I'm completely defeated. I have been unable to convince him with a single point that there exists such a thing as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Imam, I need your help. Oh Imam, will you teach me something, some knowledge, ways of convincing this man? Imam said to him, do not worry. What is the program for tomorrow? He said to him, tomorrow after Fajr Salah, we are supposed to meet at the shores of the river. And that is where the crowning ceremony happens of whoever won. Imam said to him, tomorrow, now he has come to learn something from Imam. He has come acquiring some verbal knowledge. Imam tells him, no, not all knowledge has to be taught verbally. Some knowledge has to be recognized and understood. Imam now tells him what will happen tomorrow. He says to him, oh, Nu'man, tomorrow I want you to go five hours late to your meeting. And do not worry, some Nana bin Qais wouldn't go anywhere. Because he has already tasted your defeat. He already knows he has won. He knows today is the day I am, I am crowned as the victor. So he will not go anywhere. When you, come across, when you come close to him five hours late, he will come towards you. Look, Imam is foretelling him word for word, point for point what will happen tomorrow. But sometimes there are veils on the eyes of human beings that they cannot see the truth, even as it is unfolding in front of them. Imam is telling him point by point what will happen the day after. Some man will come to you, O Nu'man, and he will grab you from your collars. And he will say to you, how dare you decide not to come today? I know why you are late. You thought that if I go late, then some man will go home and this argument will finish here. No results will be had. He said, no, I am here. You have been defeated. It's time to fulfill the promise. Imam alayhi salam says to him, O Nu'man, at that moment, I want you to say the following. I want you to say to Samnan that, Oh Samnan, I, by Allah, I left my house intending to come to you. But you won't believe what happened, Oh Samnan. All of a sudden, and for no apparent reason, and out of nowhere, a hurricane came. And it carried me with it. And it dumped me in the middle of the sea. Now, I cannot swim. And as I was battling with the waves, all of a sudden, and for no apparent reason, a tree appeared out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, and for no apparent reason, the tree began cutting itself into planks of wood. And then all of a sudden, these planks of wood came together and formed a raft. And I ascended on the raft and I pedaled my way to here. So I'm really sorry, that's why I'm late. Imam alayhi salam tells him, if Samnan was yellow at that time out of rage, his face now will be turning red and green and blue. And he will tighten his grip at you. And he will say to you, do you mock me? What is this nonsense? A hurricane cannot come all of a sudden and, and out of nowhere and for no apparent reason. A tree cannot appear for no apparent reason. A pla it cannot cut itself into planks of wood for no apparent reason. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam tells him, at that time, O oh, Nu'man, I want you to grab hold of his shoulders and shake him and say to him, O oh, Samnan, a tree cannot appear out of nowhere and for no apparent reason. It, a raft cannot appear out of no apparent reason and for and completely randomly yet you want to believe that this perfectly functioning universe around us has appeared for no apparent reason and for with no cause and no initiator and no creator at that moment imam alayhi salam is telling him some will fall to the ground 
And be indeed developed the next day exactly this happened. Some man falls to the ground with tears in his eyes. He stands up and he says to him, who taught you this knowledge? He says, me, this is my knowledge. He says, no, I have already tested your knowledge over the last two days. I know how deep you are in, 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 in water. Take me to the person who taught you this. He brings him to Imam alayhi salam. Upon entering, Imam stands up from his position and he goes and embraces him and he says to him, welcome my brother. Here Nu'man asks Imam another question. He says to him, Imam, this person is, is an atheist, he is najis. How can you embrace him and call him your brother? Imam said to him, this is the difference between you and I, O oh, Nu'man. You are waiting for the apparent to happen. We have already seen the belief that exists in, the, in, the, in, in, in his heart. And so Imam alayhi salam tells us that look, do not try and look left and right to try and find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in dua Arafah says, Hamiyat aynun la taraka alayha raqiba. Blinded is the eye that cannot see you, O oh Allah. Someone might ask the question, why? Are we talking about finding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or establishing the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the first night of Muharram? And that is because the journey that we want to embark upon is the journey of trying to establish the rights of Karbala upon us. For years, we have come here and we want to learn something from Karbala, something from the message of Imam al Hussein. But what is the right of Karbala upon us? What is the right of the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein upon us? And inshallah, through various aspects, we will try and unfold this question. But to, to establish this, we must first and foremost establish why did Imam al Hussein offer this sacrifice on the day of Ashura? What was this battle all about? A man comes to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he says, Oh Imam, why is this continuous quarrel between you, the Banu Hashem, and Banu Umayyah? Imam replies, Takhasamna fillah. Ulna sadaqallah wa qalu kadiballah. Our quarrel with Banu Umayyah is on, on only one thing. We say Allah exists and He is the most truthful. They say there is no such thing as Allah. And all this message is a play on words. In the words of Yazid himself, when the head of Imam al Hussein was brought. And this was the reason why Imam al Hussein offered the sacrifice. This was the reason why Amir al Mu'mineen offered his sacrifices. This was the reason why Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam and all the Imams from her progeny offered their sacrifices. On the first night of Muharram, traditionally we talk about Imam departing Karbala. And we begin our journey with that. But I will ask you to allow me to break that tradition. And inshallah we will do that tomorrow. On the first night of Muharram, I want to remember that holy lady. Whose house was annihilated physically in Karbala. I want to talk about Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam and her link with Karbala. Whenever a child is born to any one of us. In the house, normally that is a joyous moment. And people celebrate and laugh and enjoy that moment of the birth of the child. But not at the time of the birth of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When Imam al Hussein was born and Amir al Mu'mineen handed him into the hands of Rasulullah, Rasulullah smiled and then immediately began crying profusely. When, when Ahl al Bayt saw Rasulullah crying, they also began crying. When the tears were settled, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam asked Rasulullah, O oh Father Rasulullah, is there something wrong with my child Hussein? Rasulullah said, No, O oh daughter Fatima, but this is my brother Jibrail telling me how my Ummah will slaughter the son of yours thirsty on the plains of Karbala, how he'll, his head will be severed, how the tr horses will trample upon his body, how his tents will be burned and his women folks will be taken captive. Here Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam with tearful eyes says, O oh Father Rasul Allah, will you not be there to stop them from doing this? Rasul Allah says, O oh Fatima, it is Allah's decree 
agree that I shall not be there. She says, will Ali be there? He says, Ali will not be there. Will Hassan be there? Hassan will not be there. Will I be there so that I can carry the body of my young Hussein? He says, oh no, Fatima, you will not be there. She says, then, oh father, who will lament and who will cry for my son Hussein? Rasulullah says, Allah has promised me that he shall create a nation whose men will cry for the men of Hussein, whose women folks will cry for the women folks of Hussein, whose children will cry for the children of Hussein. Fatima to Zahra says, then, Ya Rasul Allah, let it be known that I, Fatima, will not enter into paradise until I have taken each and every one of the lovers of my Hussein with me. On, at the time of the Abbasid Khalifas, one soldier one day in the bazaar was, was, was hurting a woman, a Sayyidah woman. And when her little boy came to defend her, he slapped him on his face. The little boy with tears in his eyes, holding his cheek, turned around to him. And he said, by Allah, you would have never dared to slap me had that Fulan not slapped my mother, Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam I say, by Allah, you are right. Well, in 10 days' time, we will be lamenting and crying for the house of Imam al-Hussein, the tents of Imam al-Hussein being burned. But my heart wants to say, by Allah, no one would have dared to set alight the tents of Imam al Hussein had their predecessors not set light to the house of Fatima al Zahra. Salam. That Fatima, whom Jibreel was not permitted by Allah to enter her house without her permission, whom Malakul Mawt Israel would not dare enter her house without her permission, whom Rasul Allah for six consecutive months would stand on her door and would say assalamu alaikum ya ahla bayt al nubuwa do you permit me to enter your house oh fatima fatima would reply oh father i am your servant and this house is yours why do you need to ask for my permission rasul allah would reply that allah has ordered me not to enter your house without your permission i want to say ya rasul allah only days are after your wafa, after your martyrdom, the same door that you were ordered not to enter without permission was set alight. Fatima the Zahra was caught between the door and the wall. And the first martyr of Karbala, the first martyr of Ghadir Muhsin gave his life. <laughs> Please join me in reciting the salam for Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al arwah illati halat fi finaik. Alaykum minni jami'an. Salamu Allahi abadan. Ma baqitu wa baqiya laylu wa nahar. ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين O oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. O oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of these holy nights. O oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of the tears that flow from our eyes. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive our sins, to forgive the sins of our parents. O oh Allah, we ask you to resurrect us in the proximity of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. O oh Allah, we ask you to hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi Sahibul Asri wa Saman.